this is basically what's inspired this conversation. The Viltrox 35mm 1.8 that they very, very lovely people at Viltrox very kindly sent me. It's got that flash new aperture ring on there as well. Viltrox sent me this lens because they, they sent me this 85mm a while back. In fact, they sent me this 35mm a while back as well. And apologies to Viltrox. I've, uh, I've actually done this video about 15 times. <laughs> and now what they wanted me to do was do some street photography with it. Now, I was like, yeah, great, no worries, do that. Um, and when it turned up, I didn't realise it was going to be for the Nikon. So the Nikon is not the camera I use for street photography or weddings or events or commercial... Anything fast-paced, handheld, I don't use the Nikon for that. So my Nikon is for landscape photography or for product photography or family portraits. I photographed a sports event yesterday, a rugby. If you've never photographed a rugby or sports football thing, do it. It's a great way of getting to know your camera. So I did that yesterday. I used the Nikon for that because I like the 100-400 Sigma lens I've got and I do like the focusing. Although I know the Sigma, this is part of knowing your gear, right? The Sigma 100-400, has this thing where it's after about three hours in humid conditions, it just steams up. So yeah, I know that. The Nikon's fine, because that's where the sealed, the Sigma's lens is where the sealed as well, but it steams up. Uh, but yeah, just know my, I just know its limits. <laughs> so yeah, that's what we're talking about in this video. Uh, how important it is to know your camera, know your lenses, know, because they're separate entities. The camera and the lens is a separate thing. So if you're gonna be a good photographer, if you're gonna get any better photography, mastering your camera, ergonomics, and reliability and knowing everything about your camera and being able to use it without faffing will massively make you a better photographer. I promise. First things first, let's get the, that's the elephant in the room. Let's get the elephant out of the way. Um, first thing I'm gonna say is you need to know your exposure triangle. I don't care what camera you're using. I don't care how good you think it is. I don't care if it's the latest or singing or dancing. You can shoot it in auto, it'll do everything for you. It won't. You need to know how to use your exposure triangle. You need to know how to shoot manual. You need to understand what the camera's doing. If, you're shoot, if you shoot the rest of your life in aperture priority, I don't care. As long as you, you can see what the rest of your exposure triangle is doing, you can see what the camera was thinking, you can see what your histogram is doing, you can see what your exposure compensation is doing, you understand everything that's going on with your camera because as good as cameras are, and they are very good um, at reading scenes, they don't know what you're photographing. So if you don't take anything out for this video, Understand how to use your camera in manual, because you wouldn't learn how to drive a car necessarily in an automatic car, would you? you? You learn how to drive in a manual car and then you spend the rest of your life driving automatics. But at least you understand what the revs are doing and all that crazy stuff. So yeah, you have to have a basic understanding of the exposure triangle. Okay, as I mentioned, camera and lenses are separate. Not because they come off, that's nothing to do with it, because every lens, has different variables. So this is an 85mm prime, this is a 35mm prime, and this is a 24 to 70 standard zoom. Okay, this is the Nikon Z 24 to 70. All right, so every lens has to be learnt, unfortunately. You have to, and that's why prime lenses are so good, because you get you you need to know everything about a lens. And when it doesn't zoom, it makes it a lot, <laughs> a lot easier to learn. For example, Viltrox very really kindly sent me this lens, but I don't know whether or not I can trust it in autofocus um, situations. So I don't know whether or not if a bride was walking down the aisle and at 1.8, would this track focus? I don't know, because that's one of the things that I would have, isn't so very nice, I would have to practice. I'd have to make sure that I was 100% confident before I could use this in a professional environment that I, I trusted the aperture at 1.8, that I trusted that the, the lens was capable of, obviously it's only gonna focus as good as the camera allows it, but if the camera's a good focusing camera, which, it, which this is, is that lens gonna be good enough? So those are the things that, um, that you need to know. What are the weaknesses? Now, if the weaknesses are that it's not very good at 1.8, which this is okay at 1.8, it's not brilliant, but I'd say at 2.5, it's absolutely fine. So 2.5, I know that this is a professional lens, but the lens doesn't have weather sealing. So I would have to be careful where I use this lens. So very, very important that I know the strengths and weaknesses of this lens and any other lens. I know that this 1.8, which I love, this Filtrox 85mm 1.8, I did a video on this as well, so I'll link to that. Um, this is okay at 1.8. I wouldn't say don't use it at 1.8, but absolutely fantastic at 2.2. But I know that it suffers in um, other areas, like it doesn't have as much contrast as some of the other native lenses. But that might not be an issue for you. So um, just know your strengths and weaknesses, know whether or not they're good at focusing, and uh, yeah. 
If you keep a, a camera body for years, but keep buying new lenses, you'll always have the body that you know and you're familiar with. Um, and, and obviously you just have to then just get used to the, to, the, to the lenses. But I would always recommend keeping a camera system as long as possible so you can get used to it and really, really familiarize yourself with the menus. And you know, as, as nice as it is to get the latest and greatest all the time, it does mean that you uh, suffer as far as mastering your camera. Right, ergonomics. Now, ergonomics is something I think is massively undervalued, underappreciated. I, I shoot mainly with my Fuji camera, so I've known I've shot Fuji professionally now for nine years. So I know all my X-T3, X-T4, X-Pro2, X-100V, all the Fuji cameras I've got are set up to work pretty much the same, and I know them like the back of my hand. I'm filming on one now, I've got the X-T3 filming me now. Um, now, if I pick that camera up and then pick the X-T4 up, I know I'm very, very familiar with both. They both work exactly the same. So I know if I'm, if I'm shooting a wedding, if I'm filming a wedding, filming an event or something like that, I'm not faffing in menus. I'm not looking for anything. I'm 100% confident and that makes a massive deal. It's a massive, massive difference being 100% confident. The times I've used the Nikon early on for products and yeah, I, mean, I did a, a shoot recently with the Nikon and, and I'm fine with the Nikon now, but early days, it took me a while to get used to it and it's really, really important that you're very confident using your camera. If anything goes wrong, if anything's not working right, you know what it is and you know how to correct it very, very quickly. Now, the Q menu on the Fuji, I've got Max Pro 2 here. On the, on the, on the Fuji's, you've got a Q menu. So if you press the Q menu, you go straight into a, a custom assigned menu, which has got everything you need pretty much to use on a regular basis. It just means you haven't got to go into the menu system. Now, if you've not spent time setting up your Q menu on the Nikon, it's the I menu, if I press that, and you can see, uh, there we are, you can see everything, everything that I use on a regular basis on the Nikon. So it's really, really important that you familiarize yourself with the menus, with the Q menu. So you've got it, if, if you need to change anything that you haven't got set to one of the function buttons, which we'll get to in a minute, um, then you you know you can get it in the Q menu. You're not looking through the actual menus because on the Nikon, I'm still not very confident with the menu system on it. As much as I like the camera, um, I uh, I am more familiar with the with the Fuji. Um, I mentioned fun function buttons. Function buttons are phenomenal. If you've got function buttons on your camera, flipping, spend an hour or two setting it up. Think about what you're going to need on a regular basis and set them up. So much so that on the Nikon, I don't use this camera ever for video. Right, I never use it for video. So I've got the video button there, that red, the red one. I've got that set, so if I press that, it goes to, it changes the profiles. So I can, I can change my profile. If I'm photographing like a, a landscape photography or something like that, I can, I can change the profile to flat or something like that. That's important because I get a more accurate histogram using flat. So if I'm shooting a portrait, I'm using the standard or I'm using the portrait mode, I'll toggle over to flat to get a more accurate version of the histogram. So I've got as much light going onto the sensor as possible or that I'm not clipping or overexposing. On the Fuji, I've got the back button set all the same where possible on every single camera the same so that I can toggle between natural live view and um, and the preview you would get off your classic Chrome or your Acros or your landscape, whatever profile you've got, you know what I mean, the standard, because though they don't give you an accurate histogram. So that's one of the important things about knowing your camera, understanding its um, weaknesses, although all cameras do it, and understanding how to work around it and how to get more accurate um, information and a more accurate relationship with you and your camera. Function buttons are absolutely a must, and one or two of the Fuji cameras that come out recently without them have, have ha absolutely been the reason why I've not. There's the XE4, Fuji from XE4 had no function buttons on it at all. I just couldn't couldn't think of buying a camera with no function buttons on it. So yeah, very 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 much um, a, an important buying factor on the Nikon. There, it's hard to hold now. Just in that gap, where are we? Over there. See them? I've got the two function buttons there on the inside by the lens. Now on the Nikon. The top one is preview, so I can I can single-handedly just, if I want to chimp, I can press that button there and I can see the photograph I've just taken. I haven't got to take the camera down and look for the play button, I find it easier. I've got it set up on the Fuji as well. The front button on the X-T3, X-T4 um, is, I think the X100V as well, is the preview button. So I can literally, particularly if I'm filming, I can press like that and I can, I can, I can toggle, I can chimp basically. The one underneath it, the button underneath that, if you can see that, is, um, 
to change from single to manual to back continuous focus, single focus, manual focus, that sort of thing. So I can literally, if I'm if I'm shooting a sports event like I did yesterday, and somebody says, can I take a portrait, a team photograph, I can literally put it to single focus because I wouldn't use continuous focus for that. I can press that button, I'm straight into single focus, and then I'm, I can take their photograph, and then when I go back to shooting the sports again, I can literally just go press that button, I'm straight back into continuous again. So for me, I find that a lot more easier than going into the I menu and all that sort of thing. I can literally do it without even really looking at the, ca at the camera. Strengths and weaknesses with, uh, with, with regarding the RAW files. Now it's really, really important that you know the limits of your RAW files. It's also important that you know uh, things like whether or not your camera's got uh, ISO invariants. So uh, the Nikon cameras, I think, are all ISO invariant. Um, if you don't know what ISO invariant is, I won't mention it now, but please do. After watching this video, Google what ISO invariance is. If you've got ISO invariance in your camera system, it's so, so valuable. You really need to know and understand what ISO invariance is, but understand its limits, okay? So know when to use ISO invariance and know when you need to either bracket or expose to the right and get it right in camera. But sometimes ISO invariance is a huge, huge help, especially if it means keeping your shutter speeds where you want them to be. Knowing that you've got ISO invariance is a really, really good tool. Now, the other thing with, um, with RAWs is this is a 46 megapixel camera, a 47 megapixel camera, whatever it is. So it's a massive, massive beast of a camera. Um, and to be honest with you, sometimes, like the sports event I did yesterday, 99.9% .9 of the time I, I want this for its 47 megapixels. I, I want it to be able to produce big files for my landscape photography or for my customers or just print res or whatever. I want big files, I want that. That is what I want it for. But not, uh, like yesterday when I, was shooting 2,000 photographs of a rugby match, whereas I know that the parents are only ever going to want eight by tens maximum. Really, they might have a team photograph on the wall, 20, 16 by 20, but you do that with 24 megapixel easily. So I shot the whole day yesterday at medium raw. On that though, raw compression. Now on the Fuji, I've got lossless compression, and it's amazing because otherwise the files, even though it's a 25 mega. 26 megapixel camera. Why are they never 25 megapixels? Anyway, 26 megapixel camera, um, I've got lossless compression on, which means that the files are about 25 meg as opposed to the 40 meg, depending on the ISO you're using. They're about 25 meg. So if I'm doing a wedding, that's a massive, massive um, tool. It's huge. Like if, if it didn't have lossless compression, I'd go through uh, memory like fun. And then when you're backing up your files, your files are so many, I, I think you can take 5,000 photographs at a wedding easily. So if you take 5,000 photographs and full raw, it's just a mammoth amount of storage. So lossless compression, if you've got lossless compression, uh, do some tests, make sure that you're happy with what that compromise is. Although if you're shooting Fuji, I've got to be honest, I can't see a difference. So if you've got lossless compression and you're shooting Fuji, use it. It's absolutely amazing, it's game changing. Also it means that your, your buffer will clear quicker, you can write to the memory cards quicker uh, and everything like that. So memory cards are something I should have mentioned in this video as well really, so look, know your limits of your memory cards. Focus modes, now we're gonna keep this simple. Focus modes, AFC, AFS, um, zone focus, back, as in back button focus, and um, can, like AFF, I think it is on the Nikon. It took me ages to figure the, the AF thing, AFF thing on the Nikon. It's not the same on Fuji at all. But how to switch through them, when to use them, knowing what weaknesses are when. So when you should use a continuous, when you should use single, when you should use back button focus, how to zone focus. Now zone focusing isn't the same as using a focus zone in your camera. Using a focus zone in the camera is is literally using like a box with loads of other boxes and it's that that's the focal area it's gonna use, but it's still in single it's still in continuous. The zone focusing is actually nothing to do with the camera. It's actually, do I want to focus two meters away? Do I want to focus five meters? Do, do I want to focus at infinity? That's zone focusing. And then you use what they call hyperfocal distance, which I'm confusing the life out of me with. <laughs> Apologies. But zone focusing and focus zone in the camera are two different things. Minimum shutter for lenses. Right, so this is a 35 mil lens, this is an 85 mil lens, and this is a 24 to 70 zoom lens, standard zoom, sort of like a, what you get with a kit lens, okay? So at 24 mil, I, my minimum shutter is different to that. Hand holding, assuming I'm hand, hold, hand holding at a wedding. If I'm photographing there, 
it's I'll, I'll need a different minimum shutter speed to there. That's that's just because of the, the, your your of your reach. You're further away from the subject. You're more tight. You're more zoomed in. You you're less stable. Even with IBIS, you're still going to be less stable. You're if you're further away from the subject, any camera shake is going to be less noticeable. So for a 24 mil uh, field of view, I would always shoot around double that. I'd always shoot minimum 50th of a second. All right, that's just me. My point is when you zoom in, you have to know where your focal length is and adjust your focal your 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 shutter speed. So your minimum your minimum shutter speed changes for every lens. Like the the lens I used yesterday, the photograph of the rugby was a 400 mil. I was mostly at 400 mil. So that means my shutter speed at 400 mil would always be at least a thousand. I always double it. So at least a thousand. I was actually at between 1600 and 2000 because I wanted some nice. They were obviously running, so I wanted to compensate for the for, for the fact that they were running at distance, I was at a minimum of 1600th of a second. Now I know that my minimum shutter speed at a distance is say 1600 because I know and I've experienced and I've done practicing. But with the, with a lens like that, my minimum shutter speed might be 50, whereas a lens like the 85 mil 1.8 prime, my minimum shutter, my minimum shutter speed for that one would be about 125. I'll give you any advice from, from this video actually, take everything I've said so far on board, but get a prime lens if you haven't got one and master it. Know all the weaknesses, know all the strengths, know about the depth of field that you'll get. Don't always assume that if you buy a prime lens, it does my head in this, is if you buy a prime lens, it doesn't mean you have to shoot it at 1.8 or 1.4. You know, prime lens is a prime lens, just zoom, doesn't zoom. But it doesn't mean that if you buy a 1.8 prime lens that you have to just use everything at 1.8 because it, it just can't work like that, okay? You have to understand what depth of field does to a certain focal length, okay? So just bear that in mind. Um, I, I see a lot of people literally obsessed with just shooting everything wide open and I just with no consideration. They shoot at 1.2 because it's a 1.2 lens, like yeah. Now, the other thing I would say is the, the flat natural live view. If you've, if you've not done that, at the end of this video, get your camera and try and work out how you can toggle between flat or natural live view it is on the Fuji to um, to your normal profile. If you're using standard, if you're using landscape, if you're using portrait, whatever it is on Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fuji, whatever profile you use, always have a way of toggling, especially if you're shooting RAW, well, only if you're shooting RAW, if you're shooting JPEG, this doesn't really apply because your JPEG histogram is what you'd get anyway. But if you're shooting RAW, always have a way of pressing a button like that, that um, record button is there. Always have a way of pressing a button and it will toggle through. So as soon as I turn that on, and if I press that, I know as I press it, it will give me the option to um, to change my different profiles and my histogram will change. I, I did I did go out and do some photographs with this lens. I'll show you those photographs at the end. It was a really, really interesting um, experience. The camera felt too big, even with this little prime. It's just a massive asset. To, to have a smaller, lighter camera, which is just as powerful. Because obviously with street photography, you're not shooting at 1.8, are you? You're shooting about f8, f11, that sort of thing, so f5.6. So there's no reason, really, in my opinion, to have a, me, um, a full frame, and he's in medium format then, a full, see it's gone off, again. a full frame uh, camera for street photography. So yeah, the X100 for me, absolutely won hands down over the full frame camera for street photography, so just, really even holding it now <laughs> doing that after a while it's a workout <laughs> so what i will say is i did knock um whilst how was i holding it i don't know how i was holding because i was filming with the gopro on this hand i did notice that the aperture ring there did knock i, I was nine times out of ten i was filming I, I was shooting at f11 so f11 is there so because it's got that grip there i think i was must have been knocking must have been knocking it because my histogram kept changing. I was like, why? And I looked down and you can see it doesn't take much. Uh, there's F11. It doesn't take much before you're at F9. And literally it is, what's that? It's like half a centimeter. And knocking that aperture ring half a centimeter goes from F11 to F9. That's like, that's like nearly a stop <laughs> of light change. So it could really, really wreck your photographs just by knocking that a little bit. So yeah, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, really love the lens. And uh, thank you so much for Viltrox for, um, for sending it me. Hope you enjoyed this video. And yeah, hope you took something from it. Hope, sorry if it was too intense and locked, lots to cram in and did my best anyway. But thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already hit the subscribe button, I've got lots of other videos coming out soon. And I'm gonna try and take the channel down a more educational route, I think. So yeah, lots more videos of me sat here jabbing away on my desk. Anyway, till the next one. Thanks for watching, guys. See you soon.